episode 17.1 of Geeks Fair TV. Look, the video podcast, which is the companion, of course, to what we do with the audio show and companion to our website, www.geeksfair.tv. I'm Skip Parker, and once again, I'm joined by my hairy friend here on the right, Brad Burrows. Yes, I'm going after Duck Dynasty. If you ever watched Duck Dynasty, that's the look. I know, you're still confused by it at the moment. We, I've never heard of this Duck Dynasty. You've shown me. Looks interesting, but I have to admit, just I just have no idea. Best show on TV. If you get a chance, A&E channel. Um, and we'll show you actually how to watch it a little <laughs> Indeed, later. we will. Good segue. Okay, so tonight we've actually got a fair amount of gadgetry to get through, uh, thanks to our friends at Microsoft, haven't we? Well, a combination. Microsoft, Lenovo, and HP. Okay, so let's kick off the show tonight. And, of course, tonight... Tonight we have technology in oodles. Yes. Uh, what have we got up first? Uh, first tonight, so guys, gentlemen from HP, have been lovely to lend us the HP Revolve 810. Now this is, I suppose, one of the first sort of uh, tablet-based devices that has come out where you've got what they're calling the revolvable swivel screen coming through. Now, we've had these for a while, the HP 2940, which I actually use in my office. Right, yeah. I've had this for a long, but this is the first sort of hybrid-based Windows 8 device. So, before I go into it, what I've actually got here is an i5 processor, uh, eight and a half hours battery life, which is it's a good amount of battery life, up to 12 gig of RAM. It's got the 11.6-inch um, diagonal screen, and it's also coming with the Intel HD 400. Right, so it's got okay. a bit of, bit of processing power. Now, one of the nice things around this is obviously you've got the swivel-based ability to get into your tablet-based world. And what you've suddenly moved straight into there is a Windows 8-based tablet. Now, this thing's only sitting at around about three and a half, maybe three three pounds at this point in time. So it actually is not too bad from a weight size of things. Again, you're getting eight and a half hours battery life out of it. Really nice fluid. Obviously, you've got the ability, like any of the uh, Windows 8-based devices at this point in time, all the touch screen, you've got the Windows button coming through here. Now, I'm just going to lie this back down again and flick it around. So as you start to work through this, of course, you start to work straight into your normal desktop. You've got um, two USB uh, ports at the back, and you've also got um, the video out from here as well. Really, really good feeling device. It's actually got, almost got a, a slightly rubber-sized feel, if you like, to the screen. I can just see that's actually got the uh, the full-sized <laughs> the full-sized display port Correct. socket, isn't it, from yep. HP? So, and you've got um, the the other basics around where you've got the SD card slots on from the sides right. here. Um, power button's obviously located on the sides. They've moved that from where it used to clash a lot of this on the swivel side here. It is a really, really nice enterprise-based device if you want to get into the Windows 8 world. I'm really liking the way that I can take this on the road. And of course, if you want to use uh, your touch or your pen-based device, you can get it up and going. Really clean, really easy to use. Um, from the Windows 8 device. So I'm, I'm quite liking this one at the moment. I'm going to be having a bit, a bit more of a play. The screen's locked on that one, so it's not pivoting oh, around. Of course, yeah. <laughs> now, that's really, it is a really nice device. I, I quite like it. I'm a little surprised they are still doing the swivel, so obviously there is uh, a yep. bit of a demand there from people for it. This is actually a nice enterprise device. It's, it's sleek, it looks great, and as I say, it's quite light. Now, I noticed on this one, I'll shut it down so it logs out, is that a removable battery? Yes, it is. So that is actually a really nice feature on that one. Yeah, it's a full enterprise-based device. And as I said, 11.6-inch touchscreen device, and it's nice, eight and a half hours. That's Three great. pounds is a little bit on the heavy side for the hybrid Ultrabook devices that we're getting in the market right at the moment. Yep. But I'm enjoying it. Um, thanks to the guys at HP for loaning it to us and allowing us to have a quick play. Right. Now, second piece of technology. I have got this one right here. We're going to play musical chairs here. The ThinkPad. This is... The really, really, really slick IBM ThinkPad Helix. Yeah. Now, we've obviously got the i5 processor here tonight. Uh, Windows 8 Pro, Intel HD 400. But the cool thing about this is there's two things. This is actually not an Ultrabook, is it? No. It, now, it says Ultrabook at the front, but there is actually one very distinct uh, feature about it. It is a tablet device. So it's a hybrid. It's one of these hybrid devices we've spoke about in the show before. Now... In this device here, in the tablet, you've got six hours, and the clam, you've got ten. Yep. Now, one of the things we've noticed with a lot of the other base clam devices has been around the docking station, this unit here. So if we can cut across to the close on this, this is a docking station to meet all docking stations. Oh, yes. Um, what you've actually got here in the past, you've had little clips where you've been able to, um, for a lot of them, a lot of devices. Lenovo actually taken this a step further and actually built in a full-fledged 
docking station into the keyboard. So if you can imagine from a working day, you come in, you have it, and you're just clipping it up and going. Cutting across to what you've got there. Okay, so this device, obviously the usual suspects, headphones, power, volume. Underneath we do have ourselves a USB port, another mini display port as well. Um, and it's got a SIM card, so this is a 3G compliant device. Three. It's also got, um, if we can just slide that down, we'll get that for the camera. Cool. So one of the big things we've been debating is around hand recognition. And yep. A lot of these hybrid devices has been a sort of our benchmark as to really how good they are and the lag it takes when you're actually starting to write. Now, I like this device. This is a nice device to write on. Now, we've seen it go into the docking station this way. This is a little party trick. Docking station allows you to put it in backwards. Gives you a nice writing stand for it. So let's turn this around a bit for Brad to do some handwriting. He may have to shoot around the front there a little bit. There is absolutely no lag. I'm writing upside down here to the accuracy. But that is not bad for a, a um, pretty bad handwriting effort, to be fair. Yeah, and one of the things I'm really liking about this is that the interface or the way that this thing actually clips together for an enterprise device so if you're having a chat with somebody you can take your notes you can walk up you can sit there and pop it out of its cradle take it on the road with you move it around now this is it's from a weight perspective it's 830 grams so if you remember the other lenovo we had here a few weeks ago yep. that was only 534 so this is definitely a lot more weighty but it is 11.6 inch screen yeah it, it is, is a really massive nice device now this thing won 13 awards at CES, so yep. we, it really has got a lot of recognition for in the industry and being one of the devices to go to for the Windows 8 platform. Yep, now there's a lot to this device and rather than us prattle on for a bit longer, we've got a video here from Lenovo themselves just outlining some of the engineering that goes into the device. It's rare that a product comes along, so thoughtfully designed, we can't imagine life without it. A product like this is created by not so much an understanding of technology, but of the users of the technology. I'd like to introduce you to a business convertible unlike anything before. This is the Lenovo ThinkPad Helix. Its design was inspired by a simple, almost glaringly obvious insight. Different situations require different devices. People prefer working on their laptops or traditional PCs, but they like viewing things on their tablet. Like this, like this, or like this. This rip and flip functionality demands durability. So the ThinkPad Helix has these unique docking posts and a protective plate. And this multi-mode design doesn't come at the sacrifice of processing power. Inside you'll find up to an Intel Core i7 processor with VPro technology. You'll always get the best possible performance, whatever mode it's in. This level of performance requires a sophisticated cooling system. It consists of a tri-array of ThinkPad's patented owl wing blade fans. True mobility requires amazing battery performance. So the ThinkPad Helix has dual batteries, each only three credit cards thin. The tablet is always charged first, so it's always ready to go. You'll get over 10 hours in laptop and tablet plus modes and six hours as a tablet. People rarely get emotional about technology, unless it's instinctive. So the ThinkPad Helix comes with an integrated stylus. It's like using pen on paper, especially since your handwriting will be recognized and converted into text. You'll also find the same precision, finish, and build quality you'd expect from a ThinkPad in its keyboard. Okay, Brad, this is a sewing device. Now, yep. I, again, like we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, not a huge fan of the ThinkPads or the Lenovo line. This has really won me over. You're starting to be converted because you said the same comment about the other one as well, and you were slightly converted. Actually, no, you really like the other one. I did really like have. the other one. They're coming out with some innovation in what they're doing, oh, yeah. and um, I'm really liking this. And for me at the moment, I'm using my Surface Pro. The way I use it, in, it every day is I come in, pick it up, I click it, go off to my meetings, come back, clip it in, away I go. What I'm liking about this, though, is I've actually got a docking station built into my actual device. Yes. And that is a winning thing at the moment. That is a very nice thing. Now, I'm going to throw a little bit of controversy here. Oh, no. I was looking, I'm looking for a tablet, basically, mm -hmm. and it could be anything from a uh, Android base to Windows base. Now, I was, until I saw this device, steering towards Surface Pro. Yes. I'm now possibly going to look at a Helix. Yep. 
It is a really nice piece of kit, and I've not actually played with a device apart from the Surface that performs as well as this one. Yeah, look, and I mean, whether you're going for the Pro or the Helix, I think from a Microsoft perspective, they're actually starting to get the platform and the devices in the market to support Windows 8. Exactly. And I think that's what we're starting to see thing come through now. Um, and I'm really, really liking what Lenovo are doing here. Yeah, very good. Now, I'm going to wrap this one up and chuck it in my bag and <laughs> take it home. And hopefully no one down at your office will notice that it's gone missing. So, I have to do some travelling soon. Flying off to Singapore. You know what I'd love to be able to do? Uh, watch lots of movies endlessly. Well, yes and no. I would love to be able to be in Singapore in an hour. And the ability for us to do that is coming through. What we've got and what just happened over the weekend was the X51A happened. And this is hypersonic flight. Okay, so let's just roll the clip that we've got here just showing how that runs. Runway 4 right here, runway 4 left alpha. Copy that, sir. He's steady, that's good, we're good. Okay, right. Good room. No fear ignition. Can you go away? Okay, this thing is fast. Yes. 5,130 kilometres an hour. Yes, five point, uh, mark 5.1. Yep, it's redonkulous. Yep, I am a huge fan of the technology and what they're trying to do here. This at the moment, of course, has been done by the US military. So in the video that you just saw, you saw it being dropped by a B-52 bomber. But what they're trying to take across here is the ability to go from Auckland to Singapore or Los Angeles to New York in a matter of under an hour. And for me, I want to see this technology come through. It's something I've dreamed about since I first watched the space shuttle take off when I was a kid. Now, huge debate amongst the team here. I don't care. Yeah, you're you know, weird. You know why? Because I enjoy the aspect of flying. Yeah, I know it's cramped and it's not mm -hmm. very comfortable, but I enjoy just that downtime. You know, we don't often get that downtime in society to be able to do nothing. You're just trapped. So I'm thinking an hour's worth of flight, I'm not going to be able to watch the entire seasons of Game of Thrones or anything like that. Look, that's one and a half episodes of um, Duck Commander for me, so I'm totally happy. Duck Dynasty. Yes, yeah, yeah. Duck Commander's Duck. the show. Another show. Um, but... I like it. I want to be in London in three hours. Right. Um, I want to be in Singapore in one hour. What I can't see this being used for is domestic flights. Because you take <laughs> up and be in Wellington in about two minutes. But what I do want to see this is I want to see the implementation for flights of anything over 10 hours yep. to get us there quickly. Because when you look at, even from a medical perspective, when you're actually going up, it's been a long amount of time in the air. Yep. Uh, for people like my, my father, who's quite old, it would be great for him to be... Uh, in the place point of presence where he needs to be in a short space of time. Yeah. No, very, very, very cool. cool piece of technology though. Awesome. Okay, let's move along a little bit here. Um, let's talk about Hotmail. Okay. Or the fact that it's gone. Yes, or not Hotmail anymore. Yeah, it's not Hotmail. So uh, Microsoft recently have migrated Hotmail across into the Outlook.com space. Yes. Uh, very successful. Uh, now, what were some of the numbers around that? So right now, um, Outlook.com has 400 million active users. They've still got inactive users, around about 150 million is what they're talking about, still sitting on Hotmail that they'll look to bring across at some point in time. But one of the things that I loved, now this is going to take a little bit, 150 petabytes of data was moved in six weeks, or that's 150,000 gigabytes of data. Nice. Now, of course, Hotmail Microsoft brought from a couple of Indian guys who have made huge amounts of money. Great story if you want to read up on that, how they held out for the big cash. Um, it's been a successful service. Uh, it's had its ups and downs, obviously, but it's been relatively successful. Outlook.com, I've um, played with quite a lot now. I love it. I really like it. So we spoke about it on the audio show a few weeks ago about how Gmail, Google+, Plus, Google Hangouts, you've got all these disparate services, and they're starting to bring these together. Yep. I suppose what Microsoft's done up and down over the last year or two is they've started to bring Office 365, um, Hotmail at the time now, Outlook, and also SkyDrive, together yep and you've now got this one place we can get all those services and it's starting to work now yep so um this started it it's still an ongoing process they mm. have kicked off the process oddly in the uk so that's where they're doing the skype integration now now if you remember hotmail used to have a feature where you could con converse with your msn messenger contacts right. in the browser so they're just sort of replacing that with Skype. We've got a little video here because we can't show it yet. It hasn't been rolled out to the rest of the world, so we can't show it in operation. But here's a little video of how it will look when it gets to your desktop.
Some moments are just right for Skype. <laughs> now it's in your Outlook.com inbox. So the integration of Skype is really nice. I like it. I like the concept. Uh, Skype has also got a new feature, which is video messenger. So if people aren't there yeah. and you want to converse with them and just send them a video picture message, then you can do that. And when they jump on Skype, it pops up and allows them to see that later on. There's, there's some great stuff coming into there. Look, I, I think Outlook.com bodes very well. There's a lot of really nice features in there now. Mm-hmm. They're continuing to add more features. I, you know, I think it's a real challenge for, for Gmail. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting what Google comes up with at Google I.O., which is obviously June 10th to yep. 15th, I think it is, point in time. See what they're going to announce beyond just Google Glass, but all this integration of the services, because, yeah, I do. I think I think Microsoft stepped up a little bit in this space, and we're now got a really beyond just an email platform. Yep, game on, I say, game on. Okay, look, uh, let's just sort of, we're coming to a close here. We've got another device here. Tell me about this one. I have to declare straight away that I'm in love. And it happens to be with the Roku. Um, I've been a Roku user for about three or four years. Yep. And what the Roku is, is an IP-based TV device that allows you to get open access to 600 portals via a very, very simple device. Now, what we've actually been given tonight is a, a box that's just landed in the country from Nathan Mercer. He has just been in Hawaii and he's just bought one of these devices. They range from about 79 US dollars, so they're not a lot. What it is, it gives you HDMI output, um, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and a USB port. Yeah. Now, before I go in, I think let's cut to the video. Yes. And then we'll actually unbox this thing. Okay. Okay, Brad, let's do it. Let's take this out of the road and roll it under a steamroller right now. <laughs> yeah, I think Nathan would kill me. I wish we were streaming live and see Nate's, uh, Nathan's response on that one. Now, um, I'm going to do something here because it's not even opened yet. No, so while you're doing that, I'll just give people a, an idea of how this is actually implemented in the real world. So, look, the Roku device is a very, very small, smaller than Apple TV. It's an open platform, so portals exist that are created by um, the likes. We could create one, Crackle, Hulu, yep. paid and free services. The key thing about this is it's not about just having paid services. There are loads and loads of free services on here. So for podcasters like us yep. or TV where we do audio or we do the TV show here, we can put that up online. You also have the ability to fully search. And one of the things with the new Roku 3 is that you can now pivot things on actors and it'll bring up all the services that you've got active to, um, you've got subscribed to. So what I mean by that, let's just say you type in Jim Carrey yep. and you actually have subscribed to Netflix and a couple of free movie services like Crackle, you might have Pandora. It'll actually bring up all of those services where Jim Carrey is relevant mm. and then from there it'll show you if you want to be able to download or you can actually pay for it as well. Yep. So this is all about having legal software, that the artist getting the rights to it, but there is free stuff here. Yep. Yeah, but these things are cool. Now, while Skip's doing that, I'll just give you a bit of a few other points. One of the things that you've got here is one of the, the what they've done with the Roku is they've actually got a Wii style remote. Now, one of the cool things that they've done this time around with the remote is that you can actually play games like Angry Birds and everything, very similar to a Wii controller. But what they've done, what we're able to test at home with my children, is you actually have the ability now to plug in the headphones to the remote. So you can actually listen to TV off the remote control. Now, the remotes, you can have two or three in the same room off the one Roku device, and what that means is that your kids can quietly watch TV. Yeah, that's great. Now, let's just have a quick look at the device. I 
I'm a little loath to be pulling the wrapping off this one because... Uh, oh, we're going to do it. Oh, brilliant, okay. It's You said it. Um, so let's just unwrap this puppy. It is tiny. I mean, you can see I don't have particularly huge hands or anything like that. Um, it is... It's possibly slightly smaller than an Apple TV device. No, it is. It's about half an inch smaller. Yep. Um, from, a, from that side, I've got an Apple TV at home. And I've actually got a, a first generation Roku, a second generation Roku, and obviously this is the Roku 3. Yep. I've got about six of these running in my house. Um, and they are all streaming devices. Very cool. So on this device, you can see we've got ourselves a USB port. Um, and on the back, we've got an Ethernet, an HDMI. And this one is a Wi-Fi enabled device as well. So that's great. Um, I'm going to be interested to have a look at the USB port for um, content off my USB sticks, right? Yeah. Um, the remote, as mentioned before. Now, the interesting thing about Roku, they have these interesting fabric tags on them. I don't quite know why it's a bit of a... Just a bit of branding. They do that on the remotes as well. So you've got your um, volume control on the side of the remote, your usual functions at the so front, and your headphone socket. So this is where you can sit there and listen to your, your content off the Roku supplied headset. So Which, if we did, if we should, before we cut back, if we can ask our lovely director just to zoom in there. One of the cool things they've done is that they've actually let you have smart buttons. Now, with some of the earlier Roku remotes, they actually had um, icons built in for Netflix, Crackle, and respective things. But you can actually program the smart buttons down the bottom there, or you can use those obviously for the gaming interface when you start to play Angry Birds, whatever you're doing there. Yeah, this Sorry. is very cool. Now, I've uh, got on my laptop here uh, the Roku website. Um, go to roku.com, it really gives you uh, an opportunity to have a look at uh, what is actually available on the Roku device. Now, bear in mind that there is a little bit of stuff here that is only American-centric. Correct. So there is a trick that you can do, and Brad wrote an article about it on our website about how you can take your Roku device and connect it through to the States. Legally. Legally, and get uh, Hulu and... Amazon and uh, Netflix. Netflix. Yep available uh, to stream onto your device. And Brad, does, does it work? Can I watch an HD video from the States here in New Zealand on my DSL connection? Yes, but the caveat is you have to pay for it. Yes. Everything is paid for. Netflix you pay for, Hulu you pay for, Amazon you pay for. Now, with those articles, we've actually had some people uh, out in the industry copy parts of them, and I've had to try and clean those up. Please, please check these articles. I just updated them recently. They are the official ones that were done about two years ago when we came up with this concept. Um, of how to get around it and the services to build around it. Yep. Um, other podcasts and blogs like have stolen, if you like, little bits of this, and they've got parts of it wrong. So have a look at it, but you do need to pay for everything. We are not, there is no pirating, and we want to make sure the artists get it. Yep. But I highly recommend having a look at the Roku-based devices. Um, they range from $49 to $129, depending on what you're doing. Roku are a very solid brand to have a play around with at this point in time. Yep, very cool. Right, I think that kind of wraps us up for the rest of the, the week, actually. We've got quite a bit of content. Uh, audio podcast we've just done covers a couple of other stories. If you're interested in those, listen to it on the way to work in your car and that sort of thing. Yep. Because it's hard to watch the podcast when you're driving. Apparently it's legal too. Um, <laughs> so you can catch up with us on our website, geeksphere.tv, or dub 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 if you want to add that in there. We update a lot of stories as we go along. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, Geeksphere TV is our Twitter handle. And Geeksphere TV for both Facebook and uh, Google Plus if you want to follow us on there. Brad, what's yours? Um, I'm at Brad Boar, but next week I'm actually going to be based out of uh, Singapore. Yeah, so you'll have be... me streaming and hopefully live from Singapore. So he's taking an extra long Ethernet cable. And we'll <laughs> see how it rolls out. So that should be a bit of fun. Tune in next week to see the chaos unfold. Um, and look, I just want to say one last thing. Electronic Arts are now taken over the Star, Wars, <laughs> the Star Wars gaming franchise. America's apparently most hated company, or most mistrusted company, is now taking over this uh, gaming franchise after Disney shut down LucasArts. Yes. So this is for future games coming out. And so there's no word on what they're doing with existing games like Star Wars 1313. Yep. I just want to leave us with a tribute to what possibly could happen with this travesty of the news. Lover, hater, lover, hater. Let's cut to the video.